members, the sitting is resumed. Members will be aware that as part of the phased resumption to question time, only listed questions will be asked of ministers at this stage. Topical questions will be suspended until the 4th of July. The Business Committee has, uh, during consultations, indicated a preference that uh, initially all members listed would have an opportunity to ask their question if there is time within the period, and that only the member being listed would have an opportunity to ask a supplementary. So I will be proceeding on that basis. This is the first new question time under these arrangements and with social distancing in the chamber, which may necessitate some movement of members. However, uh, we will keep this uh, uh, under review. Uh, I hope it will work out for everyone's benefit. Um, if it is apparent that there will be time remaining as we come close to the end of the 45-minute period, I may ask for other supplementary questions. We will begin with questions to the Executive Office, and I call Claire Subton. Question number one. I call the First Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Executive launched a high-impact public information campaign in March to help prevent the spread of coronavirus and save lives. This included a leaflet drop to every home in Northern Ireland. The first phase of the campaign encouraged citizens to stay at home, keep your distance and wash your hands. And the Executive recently launched the second phase of the campaign that urges citizens to stay safe, save lives, and work safe, save lives. Advertising has appeared in local daily, weekly and Sunday newspapers, television, radio, outdoor and digital. I call Claire Sugden for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I really want to be generous um, because I recognise the unprecedented situation that, that these last number of months has made. However, I will say that I do think executive com uh, communications has been limited in that it has failed to understand the needs of the audience and what they can and what they can kind of comprehend. You know, each new announcement has brought so much confusion, anxiety, and in some cases disregard for the restrictions being announced. And I think we remove the, uh, remove this by improving our communications. So I think as, as a learning experience moving forward, not just for communications related to COVID-19, but communications from government generally. Will the First Minister commit to a review of the communication strategy with the aim of trying to improve our communications so that it reaches and gets the message across to the audience that it's intended? I thank the member for her question. and I know that she has a background in marketing and some expertise in this area. Uh, can I say to the member, we did carry out a point in time review on the entirety of the COVID strategy that was on the 4th of June, but that was looking at all of the issues contained in the strategy. I hear what she's saying in relation to communications, uh, but we have committed to uh, a daily press conference that has become now something of a staple for a lot of our journalists where they have the opportunity to directly ask questions and supplementaries of uh, whoever the Minister is at that time. The uh, Deputy First Minister and myself uh, are now committing to two of those per week. Um, other ministers then appear at the rest of the press conferences. And really, it is about speaking directly uh, to the public to seek the partnership that we think is necessary uh, to continue compliance in relation to COVID-19. We recognise that there are many who want to move faster in relation to the lifting of lockdown. There are some who have contacted us who want to actually go slower in relation to the lifting of lockdown. And for us, we have to balance all of the risks that are put in front of us and to try and move in an appropriate fashion. And we use the press conferences and indeed all of the other methods of communication to try and get across to people why we are taking the decisions, what the impact of those decisions are, and indeed for them then to go to NI Direct, uh, the government website, where there uh, is uh, a guidance put out by the various departments as well. So I hear what the member is saying. We will, of course, be looking at an overall review of this issue uh, as well as our calm strategy. But I thank her for her interest, indeed, in relation to this matter. Moving on, I call Rachel Woods. Thank you. Question two. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions 2, 9 and 15 uh, together. Significant work has uh, been undertaken by officials to date on the delivery structures for the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. 
However, important issues remain to be resolved, including the designation of a Northern Ireland Department to exercise the administrative functions of the Board on the Board's behalf, uh, the source of funding for the scheme, and clarity on how exceptions are to be interpreted. A series of discussions have taken place with officials and relevant NICS departments in relation to the administration of the scheme, and this work is ongoing. However, security funding of the scheme has not yet been confirmed. Westminster has an obligation and must deliver on its responsibility to support funding for this scheme. Efforts are continuing to resolve this issue as swiftly as possible. The Deputy First Minister and I have made it clear that we are committed to addressing all of the outstanding issues. The Westminster regulations come into force on the 29th of May. Further time is still required to deal with outstanding issues and establish the necessary arrangements for the operation of the scheme. We know that this is deeply disappointing for many victims and survivors who need the support, and we share that disappointment and will work to do all that we can to get this scheme delivered as soon as possible. I call Rachel Woods for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer. As you'll be aware, research has shown that an estimated 61% of the Northern Irish adult population have experienced a traumatic event at some point in their lifetime. So can I ask for an update on the implementation of the Regional Trauma Network? Indeed. Uh, in relation to the Regional uh, Trauma Network, the member will bear with me. Um, there has been uh, the aim, as she will know, is to deliver a, a comprehensive regional trauma service through partnership working, building on existing resources and expertise in both the statutory and the voluntary community service. The service will be based on internationally recognised psychological therapies, stepped care model, and this will encompass services provided by the voluntary and community sector in relation to step one to three, and then within the health and social care sector uh, for the higher steps from three to five. Phase one of the service is due to be launched soon. However, due to the COVID pandemic, this has been delayed. Uh, we are acutely aware uh, of how the current pandemic is affecting, uh, in particular, mental health, Deputy Speaker, and we are working with the Department of Health on how arrangements can be taken forward in relation to this very important project. I call Jonathan Buckley for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I, I know the First Minister will share in my disgust and anger at the continued blockade by some members of a victim's pension here in Northern Ireland. And while I accept that the Executive and the Assembly is the best route to deliver such a victim's pension, but in light of delay, would the Minister and the First Minister be uh, opposed to, to looking at Westminster as potentially the best route to deliver this scheme to ensure innocent victims and survivors receive the pension that they rightly deserve? I thank the member for his question. And indeed, um, the office and uh, myself in particular are particularly uh, upset that the scheme has not proceeded as it was meant to do. Uh, we do not have agreement on a designated uh, department as, as of yet. Uh, I certainly hope that that will change and that we can get agreement on a designated department. As you know, Deputy Speaker, the Department of Justice have offered to be that designated department. Uh, therefore, it is important that we proceed because it is wrong yeah. that innocent victims are not receiving what they are legally entitled to receive. And I think we should uh, recognise the hurt that has been caused by this not coming into operation on the date that it was to come into operation uh, and work to try and make sure that we have agreement uh, on the designated department as soon as possible. But if that is not possible, then given this uh, came from Westminster uh, through the Executive Formation Act originally and then through the regulations uh, of January of this year, then I think the Westminster Government have an obligation to look to other ways to deal with this issue. I call Sinead McLaughlin for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answers uh, so far. Does the Minister agree that 22 years on from the Good Friday Agreement that it is obscene that our citizens who have been brutally maimed by their fellow countrymen are still in a state of limbo regarding their pension payments? I am ashamed. Are you? Well, I think I've already said to the member that we very much should recognise the hurt and the pain that has been caused by the fact that this pension is not in place. I think we all have a duty to acknowledge that. I certainly acknowledge that. But it's something, uh, there's no point in acknowledgement uh, unless we try and make sure that it happens quickly. 
and I'm certainly committed to trying to do that. It is legally in place now, and therefore there is a, an obligation on us to make sure that this pension payment comes forward as quickly as possible so that we can help those people who were dreadfully injured uh, during that period of time, euphemistically called the Troubles. Moving on, I call Liz Kimmins. Well, good brief, Liz Concorda. Cast your tray, please. Question number three. Um, this uh, is going to be answered by the Junior Minister, Lyons. Uh, the process to select the panel of experts is underway, and it is expected that the panel will be in place by July this year. Executive Office officials provided written briefing to the Ad Hoc Committee in late April in respect of the process and provided an update on progress at a meeting on the 4th of June. I call Liz Kimmins for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask when the process is likely to be completed and the appointments made? Well, unfortunately, given the current pandemic, it has not been possible uh, to bring this work forward in as an expedient way as we might uh, have initially planned. That said, significant progress has now been made. Uh, potential members of the panel of experts have been identified, uh, contacted by officials and invited to submit an expression of interest form uh, by the 15th of June. The form allows the candidate to set out their relevant expertise. This information will then inform the selection of panel members, and panel members are expected to be appointed in July 2020. We know how uh, important uh, that this issue is uh, to, to, to many members, uh, and indeed it is important that the panel is in place so that it can support uh, the ad hoc uh, committee. Uh, and in particular, um, as the, the committee states, the panel of experts, experts are going to be there to help with the particular circumstances that we face in Northern Ireland. Those um, should not be uh, taken lightly, uh, and that's why the New Decade New Approach uh, Agreement states that the establishment of a cross-party and cross-community support will be critical to advancing uh, a Bill of Rights, and that's why the panel needs to be in place to help with that work. Thank you. Moving on, I call William Humphrey. Sir, Deputy Speaker, question number four. The management of the response to COVID-19 pandemic has been the executive's number one priority over recent months. Our objective has been to help keep people safe and to support those who have faced real hardship as a result of the pandemic. The extraordinary measures we have introduced have drastically affected the way each of us live our lives, and whilst there is no room for complacency, I am pleased to say that the measures are working, and as a result, many lives have been saved. I am pleased to say that through our regular review of these restrictions, the scientific evidence has allowed us to relax some of them, to restore some of our freedoms to work, visit and play. The Executive has also started the process of developing a recovery framework, which will have a particular focus on achieving effective health, economic and societal recovery. I call William Humphrey for supplementary. Thank you. I thank the First Minister for her answer so far. And I thank the Executive for the mitigations that they put in place to protect our people. Throughout COVID-19, there have been extra finance provided for families in some of our more deprived communities whose children qualify for school meals, free school meals. Obviously, that funding will end at the end of the academic year, at the end of this month. Could I ask the um, First Minister, given the fact that I represent some of the most deprived communities, not just in Northern Ireland, but the United Kingdom, can the Executive look at putting an extra resource for those families to address the issue of holiday hunger over the summer months? Well, I am very sympathetic to ensuring that our young people have the certainty of at least one good meal uh, per day over the summer months, and we know that that is a challenge uh, for many families. And I know this is an issue the Deputy First Minister also takes very seriously, and indeed, having spoken to the Education Minister, he is also uh, very supportive. Uh, the Department for Communities have been ensuring young people in receipt of free school meals have continued to be supported during the period uh, which they have been off school during the COVID-19 crisis. And of course, doing well in education can be dependent on a range of different home uh, and indeed personal factors. But we need to ensure that young people have the best possible opportunities to succeed when they return to school, uh, hopefully uh, in late August, September. And there are except, uh, exceptional circumstances to, to COVID due to COVID-19. 
Therefore, I will, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, be proposing to the Executive that meals continue to be provided to that cohort of children over the summer period this year if the necessary finances can be secured. Moving on, I call Mervyn Storey. Five, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. The recovery from the COVID-19 crisis will require a whole-of-government approach, together with the collective prioritisation of resources to ensure the best outcome for our citizens. There are significant financial challenges arising from the pandemic, and all departments are undertaking a reprioritisation exercise to ensure that available budgets are aligned with key priority areas. The cost implications of any expenditure proposals, including those outlined within the New Decade New Approach, which have not been specifically funded, will be considered in this context and will include all relevant public sector expenditure evaluation and assessment processes. Mervyn, story for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer. Given, obviously, the challenges that we will face, as she has made reference to in her answer, uh, I would seek that assurance that financial prudence uh, and accountability are at the centre of the decisions that will be made. I say that on the back of a number, and in fact an increasing number, of reports coming from the Controller and Auditor General, uh, not least than the one that we've had recently in regards to the land web uh, situation where he states, I am alarmed that mechanisms were not put in place to secure better value for money. I appreciate the, Can financial, come to question? the financial problems that we will face, but an assurance that that will be done in a way which is prudent and in the best interests of our citizens is vitally important. I, I thank the member for his comments, and of course, it is uh, a key principle, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when it comes to budgeting and public expenditure, that money is put to use in a way that delivers maximum benefit and that the executive is accountable. Uh, for all the spend, and that is why every expenditure decision must be supported by uh, a proportionate business case, which is properly appraised uh, and approved as well. And to help us with this task and to ensure all decisions are properly taken on the basis of informed evidence, the Department of Finance has produced a comprehensive guide to expenditure appraisal and approval, and all of the uh, projects that are in NDNA will go through uh, such a procedure. Moving on, I call Catherine Kelly. Question six. The implementation of the protocol is a reserved matter for Her Majesty's Government. On the 20th of May, the Government published its proposals for the implementation of the protocol in the command paper, the UK's approach to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Some elements of the delivery and implementation of the protocol, such as the agri-food requirements, fall within our devolved competence, and the Executive have committed to working with Her Majesty's Government to ensure the delivery of these elements by the end of the transition period. Call Captain Kelly for supplementary. Mayor, good last, Ken Corley. Minister, thank you for your answer. Can I ask what stakeholder engagement has taken place to date? Yes, indeed. The stakeholder engagement uh, has already begun, and uh, in terms of the Northern Ireland Office, uh, the Secretary of State has set up uh, a number of meetings uh, with the business community, and uh, junior ministers Kearney and Lyons attended those. Uh, I think it was last Wednesday those took place. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I intend to obviously have more stakeholder engagement as we move through the implementation of the protocol. We think it's very important uh, to be able to communicate both ways in relation to what is needed in respect of the implementation of the protocol and us then to communicate as to the stage of the negotiations in relation to that. So the stakeholder engagement will continue uh, and uh, we think that that is very much what is necessary as we move to implement the protocol. The sound system is picking up some interference there from a mobile phone, so I'd ask members to make sure it doesn't interfere with their, their microphone. Moving on, I call Harry Harvey. Thank you. Deputy Speaker, question seven. Economic recovery is a key priority for the executive, and promoting Northern Ireland overseas will be a key aspect of that recovery process. The Executive's Office in Washington, D.C., Brussels and Beijing have an important role to play in representing our priorities in those countries and regions. They will influence and lobby other government decision-makers to help promote our economic priorities, including tourism, businesses and education. 
This includes lobbying for market access, engaging with governments to get favourable relationships for our businesses and universities, and promoting our agriculture and tourism offering. Each of our overseas offices will help to identify economic opportunities with other governments and work with Invest Northern Ireland, Tourism Ireland and other organisations as part of a corporate approach to developing these opportunities. I call Harry Harvey for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you for your response, First Minister. Our tourism sector will be significantly impacted by the lack of international travel and the current quarantine regulations. Would you foresee the sector requiring additional assistance in the time ahead? Well, I think the, the sector will be very pleased with the announcements which the Executive made yesterday in relation to bringing forward the dates for the reopening of hotels, restaurants, uh, caravans, self-catering accommodation, because that gives them the opportunity uh, to market uh, their destinations. And I very much hope uh, that people living in Northern Ireland will take a look at Northern Ireland through uh, new glasses this year, and they will holiday at home, uh, perhaps visit somewhere they haven't been to for quite some time, uh, discover the delights of, one might be tempted to say, Fermanagh, maybe, uh, indeed, uh, and uh, there are other places that are available, of course. Uh, it is important that we send out a message that uh, we want to support our tourism industry, and we want people to look at the opportunities that, that there are on their doorsteps, maybe rediscover things. Uh, that they haven't been to for quite some time. So I hope, Mr Deputy Speaker, that people will take that opportunity. Moving on, I call Colin Gilnew. Margaret, last can I call you a cast ever a hot, please. Question number eight. I thank the member for his question. Before I proceed, I would like to take this opportunity to place on record the thanks of the Executive to Mr John Larkin QC, who has served as Attorney General for 10 years. The role of the Attorney General is extremely important, and Mr Larkin has fulfilled his role in an exemplary fashion. As set out in our written statement yesterday, Mr Larkin's term of office, second term of office actually, ends on the 30th of June 2020, and it is our intention to identify and appoint a successor through an open competition based on the principles that apply to public appointments. We have tasked officials to look into this process to take it forward. I can also advise members that we have agreed that Ms Brenda King, First Legislative Council, will be discharging the functions of Attorney General in the interim period. Call, call, call you for something like that. I would like to welcome that the recruitment process to replace the outgoing attorney will be through open competition as is appropriate. Auguste Boyle and Falcha wore a car of Brenda King. I would like to welcome uh, very sincerely Brenda King as an interim attorney who currently serves the executive of Ch as chief legislative advisor and has done for the past decade. She's a very experienced and respected lawyer, including as a former president of the Commonwealth Association of Legislative Council. And I think it's very welcome to increasingly see more women occupying positions at the highest levels of public life alongside yourself, First Minister, and Michelle O'Neill as joint heads of government. And if I may, I'd just like to say that I hope that Miss King doesn't experience the, a frosty reception as she must have done when she completed her work in the Arctic Circle. But I also hope. Happy I also, question. I also hope that, that, that the cold winds of change continue to blow along the corridors of male, male power and, and privilege. Um, so my question would be, does the Executive intend to review the remit of the future Attorney General, given it's a decade since the original Attorney was appointed? Well, I thank the Member for his uh, comments, and in particular uh, on behalf of, of Ms King as well. Uh, I think she will provide a very good service to us in the interim. She has been an excellent uh, First Counsel, and I think she will continue to do that um, uh, and provide us with excellent advice. Uh, in terms of terms of reference for the Attorney's Office, given that the Attorney's Office uh, was established 10 years ago, and uh, as I've said, Mr Larkin has served during those 10 years, I think it is now prudent uh, to review the terms of reference of his office and the terms and conditions of, of the post holder as well. However, we don't want to unduly delay uh, the process either in relation to appointing uh, a new uh, attorney. Um, I did um, advise the Advocate General for Northern Ireland today, as, as I should, um, that we were going to an open process and that we had appointed Ms King in the interim because it is important that she is aware 
Ms Braverman that she is aware that we have made this appointment as well. Uh, but I think that this is an opportunity, as the member has said, to look uh, and see what the terms of reference are for the office and also to look at the post holders' terms and conditions. Moving on, I call Keith Buchanan. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the planning and delivery of health and social care services cannot be underestimated and has compounded the challenges these services were already facing. This has been a continuing concern of the Executive Committee and, following consultation with ministerial colleagues, the Minister of Health has now published a strategic framework for rebuilding health and social care services in which he sets out his plans to rebuild and improve these services in what will remain a very difficult and uncertain environment for some time. Keith Buchanan for Thank you. Thank you, first Minister, for answer so far. Uh, would the First Minister agree with me that the COVID response, albeit important and very important for, from a medical point of view, but other illnesses have possibly been left behind and some people suffering from heart disease or cancer patients, etc., feel somewhat left out? Well, I, I do say to the member that um, I know that the Minister of Health has been before the House and has published his strategic framework in, in terms of rebuilding, but it is a very much a concern for the executive uh, that non-COVID health care, because of the very reason of trying to protect citizens from COVID-19, uh, had to take a back seat. And we very much are concerned about that. We want to make sure that we ramp up uh, those services again. Uh, the Minister of Health has set out how he intends to do that, and service activity plans and targets will be developed for each programme of care and speciality, with these being updated uh, every three months. So, a series of actions, including for cancer care, adult social care, mental health services, ophthalmic and dental services, and indeed all other allied health professions, will underpin his plans, and it is very important that we move ahead on those issues. I call Jerry Kelly. Uh, Kirsty Hinge, question 11, please. The Executive Office has lead responsibility for delivering actions B1 to B4. Good progress has been made on actions B1, B2, and B3. This includes the Northern Ireland Civil Service adopting the employer's guidance on recruiting people with conflict related convictions. Access to financial services and travel advice has also been improved. In relation to Action B4, also known as the Communities in Transition Project, to date delivery partners have been appointed to deliver 29 individual projects across the eight areas of focus for the project, which include the Greater Ardoyne and New Lodge area in North Belfast. I call Jerry Kelly for something. Uh, uh, go on, Brigitte Slayson, and uh, Fragris, and thank you for the, the uh, answer. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, one, two, and three have uh, made fair progress, and I think you also accepted that uh, B4 um, has been through a series of delays. And I want to congratulate the communities for persisting in this. So, would the, the First Minister, in going forward, ensure that the uh, work under B4 will continue and uh, it will build safe, confident, and resilient communities? I think the, the work in uh, B4 has been successful. Obviously, we understand that there was a delay at the start of it, but I think that was to allow communities to be part of the co-design uh, of what the interventions would be in their own community. And I think that that has been welcomed by the community. It's important that stakeholders are involved in the design of any uh, project that, that is there. Um, and there will continue to be a cross-departmental plan uh, in dealing with communities in transition. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I have been impressed with the way in which uh, the programmes have been able to flex in relation to COVID-19. Um, they still continue to deliver services, despite the fact that they've had to deal with this pandemic. Uh, and indeed, we were at the launch of a Communities in Transition project, albeit via Zoom, um, on the 29th of May, uh, up in Londonderry in the Craigan and Brandywell area. So, we have continued with the Communities in Transition programme, albeit uh, that some of it has to be delivered remotely at this time. Moving on, I call Paula Bradley. It is clear that the changes brought about by the COVID-19 crisis and the emergency response measures we had to put in place to keep people safe and protect our magnificent health service have been considerable. Our response is working well, and we know how important it is to keep up our guard. We have now reached an important point in the crisis 
where we are looking beyond the response phase towards the actions that will be needed to effect a robust and sustainable recovery, rebuild public services and restore more normal ways of living. That process has started and the ongoing review of the restrictions and relaxations that we have announced. The Executive has also started the process of developing a comprehensive recovery framework which will form an important element of the next programme for government. Called Paula Bradley. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for her answer? And we know that the programme for government um, underpins um, all of the business that we do in this House. And I suppose it's just to ask what lessons have been learned through the COVID-19 around collective responsibility and around cross-departmental working, which we know is imperative when it comes to the programme for government. Well, I thank the member for her, for her question. I think it is something that we have greatly benefited from. I mean, COVID-19 has brought many challenges, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, but it has also shown that we can work in a cross-departmental way and deliver outcomes in a fast fashion, uh, which sometimes is a challenge uh, for government departments. Uh, but we have been able to do that during this pandemic, and I think we should learn the lessons of that uh, and, and try to move forward. Uh, we were on target to deliver um, our, our new programme uh, in April before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, became a reality. Uh, obviously, since uh, that has came to us, we are now in a very different environment uh, where we were at the beginning of March. Uh, and so it's clear that some of the planning assumptions that we were adhering to uh, will have to be reviewed. But very much it is still <coughs> our plan to deliver an outcomes-based programme for government. We think that that is the way forward. And certainly this past three months have, I think, underlined the need for us to do that. Members, we are ahead of schedule. So I will take a supplementary and remaining two questions. I now call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question 13. I welcome the publication of this report. The Northern Ireland Executive has been working closely with the other devolved administrations to develop policy and legislation in relation to the common frameworks. As a result of the good intergovernmental working arrangements, the UK Government has not needed to use the freezing powers provided for in the European Union Withdrawal Act. The report references the principles for developing frameworks agreed in October 2017 at the Joint Ministerial Committee for European Negotiations and in welcoming the restoration of the executive refers to our considerations of these principles. I am pleased to announce that these were endorsed at the executive meeting yesterday. I call Mike Nesbitt for supplementary. Uh, I, I thank the First Minister and I think perhaps she has answered my supplementary by yesterday's uh, decision of the, of the executive. But I note in the report at paragraph 1.4 the principles governing frameworks were agreed by the UK, Welsh and Scottish governments in October 17, and at paragraph 1.32, the same three governments uh, have agreed to engage their legislatures in pre-legislative scrutiny. Uh, so does yesterday's decision, which you've just mentioned to the Assembly, uh, include all of those actions? Indeed, we did uh, confirm the principles yesterday at the Brexit subcommittee of the Executive. Uh, what we will do now is, uh, and I've uh, approved the correspondence to the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster to inform him of that. Uh, we will now be looking at the legislative scrutiny of the different bills that have to come uh, to this place. Obviously, there are some that will uh, be taken forward uh, at Westminster. And when that happens, I would very much hope that the committees uh, and indeed this House by legislative consent motion will have uh, a mechanism in which to be involved in the legislation. I call Jim Allister for supplementary. Taking what the Minister said in her earlier answer about withdrawal from the EU, am I now to take it that the First Minister accepts the iniquitous protocol which will create a border down the Irish Sea? Does she no longer fear or think that it will create constitutional and economic damage of a catastrophic nature? And is that why it seems the Executive are now working to implement the protocol that was hitherto anathema. Well, can I say to the member, I thank him for his question. Uh, first of all, there's not much point in standing and saying we don't accept the protocol when the protocol is legislative reality. I may not like it. I don't like it. Uh, let's be very clear about that. But my job now uh, as First Minister is to try and make sure that we minimise any um, uh, checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. 
uh, because uh, obviously there are checks at the moment, SPS checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but we have to make sure that those are kept to a minimum. Uh, we must make sure that there is unfettered access, as it says in the, in the UK Government Command paper, um, that we have unfettered access between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And we will very much want to see the government standing up to what their commitments in the command paper. I can say all the day long, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I am against the protocol, but it is legislative reality, and therefore I have to deal with it. And I call Colin McGrath. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, given the uh, destructive impact that COVID has had upon businesses here in the North, and the fact that all sectors do not want to see any further damage to their business, has any consideration been given by the Executive to extending the transition period to make sure that Brexit has the minimal amount of impact upon businesses here? Well, first of all, I will say that that is exactly what we are trying to achieve, that uh, we work with Her Majesty's Government to make sure that we have the minimum amount uh, of uh, interference with our businesses, who continue to provide a great service to the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, it is important that we continue to do that. Uh, but of course, this is a reserve matter for the United Kingdom Government. And uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster made it very clear at the Joint Committee, which the Deputy First Minister and I attended last Friday, that the UK Government would not be asking for an extension to the Brexit uh, transition period. That being the case, our focus should very much be on trying to get certainty and clarity for our businesses. They very much need that, and we are very much committed to trying to achieve that. Moving on, I call Mark Durkin. Question number 14. The Executive has reaffirmed the commitment set out in the new decade new approach to establish a graduate entry medical school on the McGee campus. Its objective now is to progress the project to secure a sustainable outcome on the fastest feasible timetable. This is a complex project involving a number of departments and external agencies, and the Executive Office is currently working with the Departments of Health, Economy and Finance to prepare further advice to the Executive on the issues which need to be addressed to secure that sustainability. I call Mark Durkin for supplement. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her response. Given the announcement from the Deputy First Minister on the 7th of May that the Executive Office would take forward the medical school project and her subsequent announcement that it had been approved, can the Executive Office give a cast iron guarantee that the McGee Medical School will be ready for admissions by September next year as announced and outline what specific dates and deadlines must be met to achieve this goal? I thank the member for his question. Uh, just yesterday at the Executive, we received an update from the Head of the Civil Service in relation uh, to this project. Um, the Strategic Investment Board are involved uh, to try and make sure that we minimise any of the risks around the delivery of this project. And the Head of the Civil Service was able to give us an update on the progress of, of the of the McGee Medical School and indeed to talk us through the risk management issues. I mean, we do not intend to make any announcement about the date of the first intake until all the necessary preparation work uh, has been completed. Uh, and we very much hope that that will continue at pace uh, in the Executive Office, because, as I said, this is a cross-departmental issue and goes across a number of departments, which is why the Executive Office uh, stepped in to try and assist in relation to making sure that things move uh, smoothly. I call Steve Aiken for supplementary. The Minister for our comments so far. Uh, Minister, uh, you will be aware, of course, that one of the key strategic partners for McGee is Ulster University. And Ulster University has uh, been involved in very significant cost overruns on another site on its campus. And indeed, I think there are some investigations ongoing to whether Ulster University are actually capable of managing projects. Therefore, can I ask the Minister what confidence she has that Ulster University are actually a suitable partner for delivering this vital project for Londonderry? Well, can I say uh, to the member, and I, no I note the comments that he's made, uh, that those ma some of those matters are, of course, a matter for the Minister for the Economy, and I'm sure he will take up uh, those matters w uh, with her. But capacity uh, and finance are, are clearly issues which will have to be examined uh, as a wider look at risk management in relation to this scheme. And that's why the head of the civil service was able to give us an update yesterday, because we have involved the strategic, invest the strategic investment board to look at all of these issues uh, so that we know where the risks are moving forward uh, and to make sure that we're in a good place in relation to the delivery of this commitment. 
And I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I understand there has been considerable capital monies committed to the McGee project, but can I ask the First Minister if there will be uh, required additional monies to go to the Department for the Economy to actually resource the running and the day-to-day -day costs, or is that something they will have to find within their own budget? Well, as I said, the financial and governance challenges um, currently facing UU um, will be overseen by the Strategic Investment Board. I think it is important that we have uh, that body looking in at what we're trying to achieve uh, to give us the confidence that uh, any risks that are identified can be managed and mitigated. Um, and, and so those matters will be taken forward by the Department for Economy in terms of the University of Ulster, but with the oversight uh, that we have at the moment from the Executive Office. Members, all 15 questions have been answered uh, by the First Minister and the Junior Minister. Uh, and as such, we've come to the end of questions to the Executive Office. I invite members to take their ease uh, for a few moments until uh, 2.45, at which point questions will resume with questions.